Thank you. Um, I suppose I had better start with the, with the title poem and the poem about the goldfish. You're under no obligation to feel sad about the goldfish. So this is called Aquarium. A man in a blue coat walks into A&E and gets in line. The tannoy is broken, a fractured buzz percolates. He lifts his shirt for the nurse and mouths. My stomach has become an aquarium. She nods and hits the button. He strips, taps the tinted glass that runs from collar to waist. The doctor kneels and squints. Around a tiny sandcastle, three goldfish drift like skeleton ships. This is most unusual, the doctor says. The man is told to drink as much as he passes and avoid contact sports. He doesn't name them straight away, but after the third month, they are Sylvia, Robert and John, after his mother and brothers. It becomes a talking point at dinner parties. He feels more attractive, though he stops eating seafood out of respect. One day, Sylvia is missing. He feels sad. A one-night stand notices a crack in the tank. He goes back to the hospital. This is most unusual, says the doctor. It's a different doctor. I know, says the man. He's sent home with a roll of masking tape. John and Robert seem lonely without Sylvia. Uh, this next one is another um, one word title that, that Flair Stack also kindly put in their competition anthology. Um, this one's called Auction, and sometimes I read, I started reading this without sort of a, a little explanation at the beginning, but I think it probably needs it. It's about eBay and how when you're on eBay you get a little star next to your name um, and that star sort of changes colours the more successful you are at eBay. So this is called Auction. I have a green meteor next to my name. Nobody has ever complained about me. Ten more perfect transactions and it will be a golden meteor. I find an old watch. It's ugly and bright blue. The ticking hand is Bart Simpson's arm. It sells quickly for $2.99. I receive a message the same day. Thank you, I am really looking forward to getting my new Bart Simpson watch. I slip it into an envelope, place it lovingly on the kitchen table and smash it three times with a hammer. It hits the bottom of the post box with the hushed jangle of settling stardust. It's not a true story. <laughs> or is it? Um, this next one I wrote and gave a title um, without perhaps realising that one day I'd have to stand and read the poem and, and utter the, the sentence, this poem is called Steve. <laughs> but this poem is called Steve. So what are you going to do about this sudden feeling that your brother-in-law, like Becky in seasons four and five of Roseanne, has been replaced by a new actor? You can hardly mention it to your sister and her kids, who seem to be playing along, who seem, in fact, happier. And what exactly would you say? That there's something in the roll of his shoulders as he tends the barbecue? That his handshake may have been too firm? They'd laugh you out of the house. The photographs on the mantelpiece all include the new Steve. Although last time you looked at the one from Florida, wasn't he wearing a hat? He smiles and hands you another beer, his crooked tooth now on the bottom row. You like the old Steve. He was dull but solid. You wonder what they did with him. Um, I've read sort of three in a row with, with one word titles, so I think by this time I've earned a slightly longer title. I'm quite interested in long and unwieldy titles. Um, so this one is, is sort of the, the poem that I've written, the longest title that I've managed to, to justify so far. It's called, Various Items Belonging to the Toppled Dictator 
are auctioned off by the state in an attempt to inject life into the struggling post-revolution economy. <laughs> Two solid gold bullocks, actual size, 17 rubies set into each snout. The white overcoat he wore 25 years ago to the opening of a hydroelectric power plant as pictured in all three state-sanctioned history textbooks. Thirty identical pairs of Italian brogues, size nine, polished to a slick crude oil gleam. A film canister, signed by Frank Capra, which reportedly once contained the original reel of It's a Wonderful Life, now holding four charcoal cell portraits and a half-smoked cigar. A 1937 Rolls-Royce Phantom, white, leather interior, an inauguration present from the British government. A brown tunic, cut from one strip of linen, laundered, five frayed holes in the torso. I'm going to aim for a little bit more sort of, um, I don't know what the word is really, I'm sort of um, conscious of, of Martin's use of the word macabre and, and use of the word dark, and maybe aim for a little bit more sort of light, if that's the opposite. Um, so this one's called The Weekend After. They drive down to the water and he stands, poor boy, ankle deep, her father's Wellington boots cavernous around his feet. She skims pebbles, never managing more than two rebounds. It's November. The sky is a different grey to the sea. One like the boundless slate of her hometown, the other like a raincoat she heard about in a song once. Preoccupied with edges, he waits for the wave's patient repossession, while she studies the five boats on the horizon, distant and still as cathedrals, trying to decide whether or not they're anchored. I'd like to, to read next my, my attempt to earn a nature poem. Um, I do admire nature poetry. I, I like um, Alice Oswald, and um, I, I also sort of feel that I, that I can't really write nature poetry. Um, so this started off as a nature poem and, and became something very different. It's called "We Discover a Severed Thumb in the Woods." Lying either side of it, we play. Who dares get their tongue closest? It nestles in a pile of wet leaves, real as a joke thumb. It mightn't be a thumb after all, could be a stubby finger. It's hard to tell without the context of a hand. It smells like the thing you can't find in the fridge. You are winning, your tongue is practically touching it. Someone told me that was a poem about masculinity, I don't know. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to read two more. Um, the first one is called Gemella, which is the Italian word for twin, and is um, sort of based on a true story, although not perhaps, perhaps as much as I, I would have liked. So I'll just try and find it. It's hard to hold a microphone and flick through the book. Gemella. The last person I expect to see, while queuing for the funicolare on the shore of Lake Como, is my paternal grandmother, eight months dead. Yet here she is, white curls, lavender blouse, tapping her foot the way she always used to tap her foot. The question is how she managed to live with the illness for so long. Ten years since the day we caught her moon-eyed, stashing butter in an upstairs cupboard, accusing the neighbours of stealing her slippers. Oh, she played it beautifully, 
flower girling our names one by one. That lunch when, innocent as a drunk, she revealed she'd once been engaged to a para from Salford who died in the war. That Christmas Eve, the last, she escaped from the home. We drove two hours sick in the snow, only to find her drinking sherry, watching Morecambe and Wise with an Indian family in the house she grew up in. The time she replaced herself with a tiny off-white waxwork and laughed all the way to Manchester Airport while we lugged a box of sandbags and bricks up the steps at St Anne's. She's playing that game where we both pretend not to recognise each other. Steps into the carriage, clutching the hand of a toddler who looks nothing like me. <laughs> the last one is a poem that I wrote for my best friend when he asked me to be best man at his wedding. Um, he lived in Germany and his girlfriend was American and she lived in South Carolina and they, they had a long distance relationship for a couple of years. And I never got to read it at his wedding because his wedding didn't happen and they broke up, so, which I was slightly disappointed about. Um, but obviously not as much as they were. Um, <laughs> this is called Breadth. After the air miles have all unraveled behind you and you have settled into your new country, visit the coast. Crouch barefoot at the shoreline and lower both hands into the water until your fingertips are eight small sea stacks. Imagine me doing the same until the ocean that separates us has become an object that we are both holding, a new blue bedsheet that we are unfolding together in your room. Watch the waves bunching dutifully about your ankles. Each one is an echo of my beckoning arms.